Bruh. Underdog has a special, special, talking short bus special line for Debo Samuel right now on their app, on their platform. You can go to Underdog Fantasy and take the over on Debo Samuel. One, literally one receiving yard this weekend against Green Bay. And you might be asking, what the fook? Well, I'll tell you what the fook, right? platforms do this they allow these special lines so they can get new users on their platform what you don't know is that you're going to go on your platform you're going to go on that platform and you're going to end up losing way more money than whatever you win on this Debo Samuel line okay these gambling sites know the lifetime value of a customer right if it costs them whatever you end up throwing down on the Debo Samuel line a hundred dollars they know that you're worth five eight nine thousand times that as a customer but you don't know that so for right now you're going to be really happy you're going to go to underdogfantasy.com and when you deposit for the first time you're going to get a hundred percent deposit match so if you put down 10 bucks you're going to get 20 to play with if you put down 20 40 40 80 80 160 whatever the fuck the case may be whatever your wallet's looking like fat or like snacks bdge the promo code bdge the link will be the first thing in the description you're going to use it and when you use it, you're going to get the 100% deposit match. You're going to put it all on Debo Samuel, and then you probably have to choose another uh, another player. I do think they have a max bet on this. I want to say you can only put up to 25 or 50 on the Debo Samuel line. But if you've ever wanted to get into underdog fantasy and you haven't yet, you ever want to get into these player props, you haven't yet. This is, I mean, it's literally, you know, I talk about the lock and the McGainum and I lose all those all the time. This one, I'm, I'm pretty confident I'm not going to lose this one. So Debo Samuel over one receiving yard this weekend in the playoffs, baby. The fucking playoffs? All right. Fuck the playoffs because we are a fantasy football show over here, all right? And we're looking at 2022. This video is going to be covering 2022 fantasy football rankings, but a little differently, all right? I'm not just going to sit here like a fucking gallon of expired milk, a fucking can of tuna fish that's been sitting on top of your fridge for nine months. We're going to do something proactive, and as I typically do with my life, I outsource to Twitter. And I say, hey, finished up my first lick of 2022 fantasy football rankings. Who art thou, whomstvs, I believe was the word I used, uh, are y'all most curious about? in my rankings. So I took the consensus of who you guys wanted to know for the rankings, and we took a popular vote, right? This is some presidential shit we're on right now. And uh, I gathered the names that were most frequently tweeted at me. And thus, we're gonna go down the list of 10 players. We're gonna do five today, and then we're gonna do five in the next video. And we're gonna break down where I have them, where they're ranked overall, where they're ranked ab uh, among their position, and uh, talk a little bit about what I expect to see from these players in the off season as well as uh, next year for fantasy football. So if you enjoy the video, there's nothing I need you to do besides subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up, leave a comment, tell me I look good, um, share it with your friends, like all that shit. I just need, I, there's nothing I need you to do except those 55 fucking things. All right, I'm fucking bike, baby. Sorry, I took a little break from content, had to re-energize, but trust me, we are in full go mode, full force mode. Hit Underdog Fantasy. The link to the App Store will be in the description. Y'all know what we have to do before we start the actual content, the cream of this bitch. We have to tuck our shirts in. It's going to be difficult for me today, but we've got to stop yelling. And let's see. So again, we won't be going through every single one of my rankings, not even close to all of them, but they are up available for members on bdge.store forward slash community. If you become a Big Dogs member, you will have access to our Discord, which gets you access to our Dynasty Leagues. If you've ever wanted to fuck with Dynasty throughout the offseason, now is the time. Actually, we're about to wrap up a partnership with Sleeper as well. I got a call at 1 p.m. today. We're moving. We are fucking moving. So let's move this, uh, this video in the direction of giving y'all value. And I also want to say these rankings... Right when I when I say this player is ranked here overall, these are super flex rankings. So the skill position players, the only type of leagues we play in, the skill position players are going to be pushed down a little bit in the overall rankings. Won't change them in the positional whatsoever. And without a doubt, the most frequently tweeted player was Mister Saquon Barkley. I have Saquon Barkley currently ranked 32 overall, the running back 14. 32 would put him at the 308. Again, super flex. So you think of, you know, five, six, seven, maybe even eight quarterbacks ranked above him. So typically that might be at the end of the second, 
early third round, which I think is probably about where you're going to see Saquon go, maybe a little bit higher, maybe mid to late second round in most drafts next year. The pros of Mr. Saquon Barkley going into next year, as opposed to the travesty of what this year was, is he will be two years removed from his ACL tear. We like players two years removed, not one year removed, especially someone who was still recovering from that injury when the regular season kicked off this year. I think that is going underreported, right? We were very, very, he was our number one player. If you bought our draft guide last year, if you went to the all fade list in our draft guide, the first player listed on that list was Saquon Barkley. We were there's no way we were touching him at the 105, the 106, the 107 where he was going in drafts. All right, so the pros, 2 years removed from the ACL. Second pro, he's a pro. He's a professional. It's about all we have to say in terms of the pros, the cons, just about everything. And I tweeted this out this summer. We had a lot of Giants fans very, very, very angry at me. I asked, does Saquon have anything going for him this year outside of athleticism? He's coming off the ACL injury. He's clearly not 100%. One of the worst O-lines in the league. Kenny G is already hurt. The New York Giants offense might implode again. They ranked 31st in points per game last year. They did it again this year. The problem with like fantasy Twitter and I guess fantasy YouTube is that everyone expects these drastic turnarounds. Things don't happen that way. Things happen progressively, right? Things happen one step at a time. You very, very rarely see the jump that like the Bengals took this year. More often than not, you see the Giants. Everyone's very optimistic about things. They're like, oh, we drafted this guy. Therefore, our fucking entire team is going to get three more wins. Like it doesn't happen like that. A lot of times it's like you're a bad team. Maybe you get a tiny bit worse before you get better or you're a bad team and then you get incrementally better each year. And then one year, all of a sudden, you know, you have three extra wins or four extra wins. That's not the case for the Giants. Again, also, also, I, I want to uh, preface by saying these rankings are in my, it's, it's very difficult to do rankings at this time of the year, obviously, because there's the draft, there's free agents, there's new coaches, there's trade, you know, all this nonsense happening in the offseason. These rankings are with the mindset that the exact team that the players have right now is going to be the team that they have next year. We do cover free agents, though, right? Like if we're talking about a running back and then their backfield mate is a free agent this offseason, we will take that into consideration as well, which we'll talk about with the next guy that was the second most popular player on the tweet thread. Also, don't call my threads threads anymore on Twitter, right? This is a public service fucking announcement, an Italian public service announcement. My tweet threads are no longer called threads. They're called lasagnas. I don't know if I want to make that plural or not, but they're lasagna, all right? And someone's like, I don't get it. What's a lasagna? What do you mean, what's a lasagna? They're fucking stacked. Tweet one, tweet two, tweet three, tweet four. No longer threads. You call my shit lasagna. And if I had a good lasagna, I cooked up that day on Twitter, all right? And follow me on Twitter, at Nick Ercolano. So uh, with Saquon right now, yes, he is ranked pretty, 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 pretty low. I don't know how you can be too optimistic about him. We obviously saw the greatness of Saquon his rookie year. 2,000 yards from scrimmage in an offense that was, you know, a little bit better than what we have right now, but not not much better. Saquon's still very weary. The big question marks this offseason, they'll get a new GM, they'll get a new head coach. You know, we've seen a lot of rumors swirling around about Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson having interest in going to New York. So there's uh, if, if Saquon's going to go anywhere, right, he's ranked here. If he's going to go anywhere in the rankings this offseason, this summer, it's going to be up, not down. Because he's I'm kind of already ranking him at his floor with this current New York Giants team in mind. But going forward, Saquon uh, will probably rise up as these holes within the New York Giants team start to fill themselves a wee bit. Second most asked about player on this list is Mr. Elijah Mitchell, running back, San Francisco 49ers. I currently have him ranked 34th overall in the Superflex overall rankings, running back 15 at the 310. If your brains are working like mine currently is today, you will remember that Saquon was running back 14. I have Elijah Mitchell one spot behind him at running back 15 going into this year, and man, is Elijah Mitchell just good at football. Everything that we had talked about last offseason, I made a, a video going in-depth specifically about Elijah Mitchell. Last offseason, I did a, uh, a series called Don't Say the Cars Topless Tuesdays, where we exposed players that were going way too low or way too high in ADP in rookie drafts. And uh, Elijah Mitchell was certainly one of those players. We will be starting to drop dynasty and rookie content heavily on this channel within the next few weeks. When you look at Elijah Mitchell, we not only love him as a player, super athletic, can play all three downs, very good prospect, tons of college production. I mean, we're off of the college shit. He's obviously done it in the NFL already. But what I like more is when you look at the free agents this offseason for the 49ers backfield, you literally have everyone except Mr. Trey 
Sermon and Trey Sermon's going to need a fucking exorcism in order for Kyle Shanahan to believe he's a new person at this point. But we look at Raheem Mostert, Trenton Cannon, Jeff Wilson, Jamichael Hasty. Well, I don't know why Trent Cannon's listed twice with two different contracts. Love to see it. Spotrack. All five of those guys, all five of those guys, including Trenton Cannon and Trenton Cannon's twin with the exact same name, are free agents this offseason. Okay, that opens up just like every possibility of this committee to be a committee. No more uh, Elijah Mitchell. I mean, when you when you watch Elijah Mitchell play, it's just a different ballpark than Trey Sermon, to be honest with you. When you watch or even like Raheem Mostert, right? Like when you watch Elijah Mitchell play, you're like, OK, he looks like a workhorse running back in the NFL. He looks like he could take a beating throughout the entire course of the season. He looks like he could do a lot of good. I know he got injured this year and he missed some time and et cetera, but he just gives you the feel. It makes you feel comfy inside. It makes you feel wholesome inside, you know, whereas like Raheem Mostert, there was no point in anyone's career his included, in which you watched Raheem Mostert and you were like, yeah, this guy is going to be the workhorse for 16 games and be able to carry the Rock 20 times per game. It's just, it's like meeting a, a baddie down in a Mexico resort, right? You're staying with your friends and you meet a girl who's there on vacation as well. You know that shit's going to be magical for about a second, but you don't put a ring on it, right? That's Raheem Mostert in real life terminology, okay? Uh, Elijah Mitchell is, you know, would anyone be surprised if Trey Sermon's a thing next year? No, but it's very clear that Kyle Shanahan loves Elijah Mitchell. It is very clear that Elijah Mitchell is very good at football. This is how excited I am. I'm uh, I have him high. I have him high. And like the only way this ranking is going to change, in my opinion, is, I mean, what, they're not going to get anybody in for agency. Maybe they take like a fourth, sixth round running back in the draft. I don't, I don't fucking know. I mean, they obviously use the draft capital on Trey Sermon third round, right, as opposed to Elijah Mitchell's sixth round, do they try to insert Trey Sermon back into the committee of this backfield next year? Curious to see this playoff game to see if Trey Sermon gets any extra run against the Packers. Do they try to open up camp as a competition? And does Trey Sermon actually take his fucking joke of a life right now seriously, get in shape, and actually form some sort of committee, right? I think training camp reports, just like last year, where the Niners beat reporters were as good at their job as... Like, I'm as good as my job, which is not very good. And just saying a bunch of nonsensical things about Brandon Ayuk and Trey Sermon and all these things and it's just not being true. I don't remember where I was going with that thought. But um, this is what happens when you don't make content for two or three weeks. Your brain starts going in different directions. You're not in content mode brain. My big brain has gotten smaller. Yeah, like, do we hear reports, you know, Trey Sermon's running with the ones, or he's like the 1B to Elijah Mitchell's 1A, rather than just Mitchell being the workhorse. I do think we're going to get a huge, huge season out of Mitchell. I think people are going to try to sell him high. I think he has, like, that Aaron Jones-ish type upside, and I'm really excited to see it in the future years. So if you grabbed Elijah Mitchell in Dynasty rookie drafts last year, shout out to your mother. Number three most asked about player, I don't know why y'all are curious about this guy, Cooper Cup. There's really nothing to be fucking curious about. He's my fourth overall ranked player in super flex draft. So I have Jonathan Taylor at one, Josh Allen at two, Derrick Henry at three, Cooper Cup at four, obviously the wide receiver one. He is the 104. Don't know what I need to say here. Second year with uh, Matt Stafford. Who knows when Robert Woods will be back? Not that it fucking matters. I mean, listen, it's with Odell Beckham, with Robert Woods, without Robert Woods, in the woods, on the beach, with your bitch. It doesn't matter. Like Cooper Cup's putting numbers on the fucking board. All right. So number four overall, like Cooper Cup was legitimately uh, a a league winning wide receiver this year. Averaged over at my my uh, point in which I start to think of players as league winning players is when they start to average over twenty half PPR points per game over the course of the season. He did that this year, which is not a normal thing for wide receivers, but he did it so consistently. And it wasn't like yes, he put up a ton of fucking touchdowns, but he was getting receptions, yards. It was like you know some players do this, like Devonte Adams did it, but I felt like some of that was on the back of seventeen, eighteen, whatever, how many touchdowns he had. Cooper Cup just consistently balled out every game no matter what visitary fucking restrictions he had to the end zone so this will be the first year in a while in which I am um, happy to draft a wide receiver in the first round actually I believe I have three or four wide receivers in the top 12 whereas last year I feel like I only had Devontae Adams so we've changed our strategy a little bit nothing nothing major let me see what we got here we have one two we have four wide receivers in the top 11 draft spots this year in my rankings again you can get that at bg bdge.store forward slash community all right let's move on to the fourth player and i realize i'm going this i'm going at this with the pace of someone who had a torn achilles see what i did there we're sticking in la 
and we're sticking to Mr. Cam Akers, who tore his Achilles in, I think it was July or August, the running back for the Los Angeles Rams. I currently cannot decide where I want to rank him yet because there's just so much nonsense going on with the Akers. I have him at running back 16. So I have Saquon at 14. I have Elijah Mitchell at 15. I have Cam Akers at 16. I started to do some research on, you know, why he came back from the Achilles so strong and so quickly and it's advancements in technologies obviously the way they used to do achilles tendon surgeries they used to really slice like your entire fucking leg open like that shit was a like you were playing fucking peekaboo but they don't do that anymore the slice that they make now is just a few centimeters thick and then they can attach the achilles tendon uh to each other and let them give them a little kissy kissy poo and because the slice is no longer like this it's like this it's the only time where that's a positive in life the recovery time is much, much, much uh, smaller, right? Smaller slice in the tendon, uh, minimizes scar tissue, minimizes atrophy, uh, time for the wound to actually heal is much, much smaller. So you can get into rehab much, much quicker. They also put in this, like, the doctor said it was like an internal brace. So there's like an internal brace they put inside Cam Akers to attach the two parts of the Achilles. I'm not sure why that wasn't always a thing. I'm not sure why that's like a new piece of technology, but apparently it is. They had a lot of new parts of Dr surgical medical technologies involved in this procedure which is why he came back so strong looked great this weekend George per carry numbers he hasn't looked great on the ground but he had a lot of big calls called back this weekend super involved in the past game had more touches than Sony Michelle like they want to ride this kid my my concern is my, my the only concern I have for acres which it's hard to have a concern I'm really excited to watch him play again in the playoffs. I kind of hope they beat the Bucks. Selfishly, I just hope the Rams go to the Super Bowl just so I can continue to watch Akers from a fantasy perspective. Literally the only thing I give a fuck about right now. With Akers, it's like we never we never saw Akers 100%. We don't know what Akers was going to become in the NFL, right? We were hyped on him last year. We loved him. We thought he could become something of the league-winning type running back upside, like up here, right? We never got to actually witness what that would be. So you tear your Achilles... And sometimes when you tear your Achilles, you don't come back to to that same player, whatever you were going to be. We don't know how high it was going to be. We don't know the level of play he was going to be at. But a lot of times you don't come actually back to that ceiling that you had before. Now, his ceiling might have moved down from here to like here. And here might still be a very good player. We just might not have the ceiling that we had before. So unless he looks amazing the next two games or something, I don't think he's 100% yet. Unless he looks amazing the next two games, I'm not going to be drafting Akers where at least this early in the offseason, right? And you can use these rankings for best ball drafts. Underdog Fantasy best ball drafts are open already. We will be doing a lot of those, which is another reason for y'all to uh, go sign up for Underdog right now. I'll send out invites in Twitter and the Discord, all that shit, which is why I'm not going to be ranking Akers as high as I would have last year. Going into last year, I think he was as high as like my number eight overall player. And this year probably won't go that high just because we don't know what the upside of him and his Achilles is going to do to him as a player. So I have Akers down at 16. So we had Barkley, Mitchell, and Akers, 14, 15, 16. The last player of the five, and again, we have five more players after this. It will be in the next video. C-Mac, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, Jamar Chase, J.K. Dobbins were the other five most asked about players. Number five on this list. And before I do so, uh, drop a comment. Maybe I'll replace like C-Mac or something like that. Maybe I'll replace one of the boring players in the next video with a guy who's the most commented about or the most thumbsed up comments down below. Let me know who you're most curious about in my rankings if you're not going to sign up to be a Big Dog member, which makes you a piece of shit in my book. Drop a comment with who you want to know their ranking for the next year. I'm on Ross St. Brown is number five on this list. Wide receiver Detroit Lions, monster rookie year. Uh, Currently ranked 64th overall in my rankings. Wide receiver 20, though. Wide receiver 20. 64 is the 604. And again, this is super flex. So in a normal one quarterback league, that's probably going to be in the range of like very back end of the fourth, more likely early, early fifth round pick. Um, So probably around like the 412, 501, where guys like, you know, like Tyler Lockett, Robert Woods, like the Cooper Cup, Jamar Chases were drafted. Amon Rob will be a very popular pick in that part of the draft. And I think he's deservedly so going in that range. Amon Ross St. Brown, I mean, he wasn't a league winner for the entire year, but he was a league winner down the stretch. Like his last six games were insane. He finished his rookie year 16 games, so he didn't play the 17 games. So you have the 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 pure, the pure, unblemished 16 game sample size. 119 targets, 90 receptions, 912 receiving yards, five touchdowns, adds 61 yards, and a touchdown on the ground. So all intents and purposes, this dude balled the fuck out in his rookie year. And you look at the home stretch, the last six games of the season. I mean, 
12 targets, 12 targets, 11 targets, 11 targets, 11 targets, 10 targets, 10 catches, 8 catches, 8 catches, 9 catches, 8 catches, 8 catches. 73 receiving yards was the fewest amount of yards in any of those games. Just an unbelievable finish. Just so involved in this offense. Didn't matter what quarterback was under center. Jared Goff, fucking Tim Boyle. No matter. Don't my shit, don't matter. For, for Mr. Amon Ra St. Brown, the sun god, all right? And you look at these splits. This is the only concern I have, all right? They had a lot of injuries this year in Detroit. They didn't have any competition for targets, and the only competition they had for targets was TJ Hawkinson. TJ Hawkinson missed the end of the season. The four games in which Amon Ra St. Brown played without TJ Hawkinson, pretty fucking drastic. 25 PPR points per game in the four games without TJ Hawkinson. Now, again, I try to, one of the lessons I learned last year, two years ago, in the last few years, is anytime you need to make a case for why some player was so fucking good that you don't actually think he's good, you're probably going in the wrong direction. And Amon Ross St. Brown was a baller, did a lot of it without TJ Hawkinson, but I mean, I don't know. And again, I'm trying to be objective and just look at it for where the team is right now, but I very, very much expect the Detroit Lions to invest in a top wide receiver in this year's draft class. There's a couple guys that are really, really good. Now, they have the second overall pick, so they're not going to take a wide receiver there, but they do have the Rams' first-round pick as well for the Stafford trade, and that's going to be probably in the 25 to 30 range, which is probably wide receiver range-ish if they go with anyone from, uh, I mean, Traylon Burks, for some reason, falling down draft boards and mock drafts, Garrett Wilson out of Ohio State, uh, Drake London at USC. I love that fucking kid. If any of those three kids drop there, which I don't really expect to, but if they do get their hands on him, they've got a new alpha in town in Detroit. But the easy comp for Amon Ross St. Brown for me is Tyler Boyd, uh, maybe a more explosive version of Tyler Boyd, where it's like he can very much be the alpha in your off in your passing game, but you probably don't necessarily want him to be, right? Amon Ross St. Brown was a guy who was averaging like 9 to 10 yards per reception. So it wasn't a ton of big plays. It was just more like chain moving type plays. And typically an alpha is a guy that's going to be down the field making a lot more, you know, sideline catches of 17 yards, post routes of 27 yards, shit like that, where I think one of these rookie wide receivers can come in, maybe not immediately, but in a year or two, be the actual alpha in this Detroit offense where I'm not sure that we're going to consistently see that for, Am for Amon Ross. I think he's going to be an amazing like secondary wide receiver going forward. So if you're in dynasty, I think he's just one of those players that you don't think too hard about it. And you're just happy to have him on your team as like a high end wide receiver three, a flex play going forward, especially in PPR leagues. You don't need to be trading every fucking player in dynasty. If their value goes up or down, you can just enjoy a player being on your team. It is possible to do that despite what everything on Twitter tells you all the time. Okay. So top 20 wide receiver for me next year at this current moment, Amon Ra, St. Brown, the Sun God. That will be it for today's video. We are going to be dropping another video tomorrow, I believe. I think we're going to do a rookie mock draft, uh, a rookie dynasty first round mock draft, probably one quarterback leagues because I have not dove in into quarterbacks yet. And we're not going to be drafting any of these quarterbacks in the first round. So, therefore, I don't have to cover any quarterbacks in this rookie mock draft. Only running backs, wide receivers, and there's no tight ends this year that will crack the first round of rookie drafts. But make sure you're subscribed because we'll be doing a ton of Dynasty rookie shit, getting you ready for the upcoming off season. Uh, make sure you're subscribed because we'll be doing part two to this exact video. Timestamps were below, hopefully, because I just spent like 48 minutes on every single one of those players. How long was this video for? Man, it felt good getting back on the fucking microphone, chopping it up with y'all. All right, that's all I got for you today. I love you. Thumbs up. Make sure you go snag that underdog special line on Debo Samuel uh, and enjoy the weekend, even though I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.